beautiful young minds know, and where does this knowledge come from? Well, of course, this is a question that philosophers have pondered for millennia, and of course, one of the first to ponder this question was Plato. And Plato, he pondered this question and concluded that actually our senses do not provide sufficient data about our world to specify it for us, and therefore, that knowledge was innate. And of course, after him, a number of different philosophers agreed with him. Now, Aristotle, who was Plato's pupil, disagreed with his mentor, and after pondering this question, decided that in fact, our senses do provide sufficient data to specify our world, and therefore, that knowledge was acquired. And of course, many philosophers following him agreed with him, like John Locke and David Hume, among others. And of course, this gave rise to the nature-nurture dichotomy. Now, no one today really subscribes any longer to the dichotomy as such, but many people think about it in terms of the interaction between nature and nurture. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you today that this dichotomy itself has become outmoded. It is not scientifically plausible that we need to abandon it and we need to instead consider the biological development of the organism. So if we look at the biological development of organisms, first and foremost, organisms are embedded in their environments and they develop and evolve in those environments. Second of all, organisms are composed of multiple hierarchically organized systems that increase in complexity as you go up the scale. Another thing that biology teaches us and that developmental science teaches us is that the DNA that we possess does not code anything but protein. Therefore, knowledge cannot be coded in our DNA. That means that we have to look elsewhere in the system. And what developmental science has taught us today is that that elsewhere happens to be the multiple and bi-directional interactions between all of those systems of organization that form the organism. And in addition to that, due to the fact that the organism is completely porous to its environment, and therefore the environment and the organism interact bi-directionally with one another on an ongoing basis. Now, of course, the brain, the human brain, which is where our knowledge is situated, is the repository of all of those developmental interactions. And that, therefore, means that knowledge is really something that emerges from those developmental interactions. It's not coded anywhere. Now, if we look at the development of the nervous system, we find that the brain quadruples in size during the first six years. And if we look more closely at the brain mass index, we find that it's during the first three years of life that the brain increases enormously in size. And if we take a slice of cortical tissue at one month of age, and we simply look at those neurons, those are those black bodies that you see there, and the little processes that issue from them look like spiders, those are the dendrites that connect to other neurons. You see that those connections are pretty sparse. But if you then take a slice at two years of age of the cortex, you, you see how much more those connections have um, grown and how much more dense uh, that network happens to be. So what does that buy the developing organism? Well, what it buys the developing organism is a plasticity and an openness to experience. Well, let's look at the experience of babies in their daily lives. Well, when babies interact with their caregivers or anyone else for that matter, they get to see faces, they get to hear people talking to them, they get touched, they smell things, they taste things, they're moved. So babies have these very rich multi-sensory uh, experiences on a daily basis, and when you combine that with the plasticity and openness of the nervous system to experience, what you've got is the acquisition of knowledge, in fact. So, let's start at the beginning and ask, what do babies know at birth? Well, the famous American philosopher psychologist suggested, and this is known by everyone, William James, that the newborn mind basically experiences blooming, buzzing confusion. But today, evolutionary psychologists actually make the opposite claim, and they actually agree with Plato, and that is that we are born with core knowledge that we inherit from our ancestors. But as I've already indicated, this view cannot be biologically plausible because our DNA 
does not encode anything but proteins. So therefore, we need an alternative view to this one. And what I'd like to suggest is a view that many today in developmental science hold, which is that knowledge comes from development itself, from all those developmental interactions that I showed you before. And secondly, I'd like to suggest to you is that actually babies at birth are dilettantes, primarily because of their neural um, and it, uh, their neural immaturity and their inexperience with the world. So what is a dilettante? Well, a dilettante, if you look it up in the dictionary, is a dabbler, someone does, who has a lot of broad knowledge but doesn't really know very much about anything much. So what sort of evidence do we have to support this kind of an alternative view? Well, the first thing that we know is that both adults and babies are very good at face discrimination, so they can discriminate human faces, they can discriminate the faces of their own race, and they can discriminate the speech sounds of their own language. We also happen to know that both adults and babies as well are able to perceive others as unitary events. That is to say, that baby, when that baby is interacting with that person, for that baby, that's mom. It's not a separate face and a separate voice. It's all integrated. And that's made possible by the fact that our brains allow us to perform something that we refer to as multisensory integration. Our brains actually combine the sights, sounds, touches, smells into unitary events. And my favorite quote, actually, that captures this very nicely is, it matters little through which sense I realize that I have stumbled into a pigsty, or blundered, I should say. So, we also happen to know something very interesting. It's remarkable that young babies actually happen to be able to discriminate faces of other species, like monkeys, faces of other races, races other than their own. And they can actually discriminate speech sounds that are the speech sounds in almost every single language in this world. In addition to that, in our lab, we recently discovered that babies can perceive the faces and vocalizations of other species as unitary. So here's an experiment that we did where we showed babies this video of the same monkey making two different vocalizations in silence first. And what we do is we simply measure how much time babies look at each one of those. And then we present this to them. Okay, so the monkey is now making a coo sound. And our prediction was that babies should look, look longer at that cooing face if they are connecting the vocalization that they're hearing with the vocalization that they're seeing. And here's a baby in our lab happily looking at these different videos. And what we do, <laughs> what we do simply is we score how much time the baby looks to each side. Now here are the data, these are the, these are the data from newborn babies that we tested in this particular experiment. And what you can see is that the orange bar shows you that the babies actually looked longer at the face that was vocalizing during the vocalization than they looked at that same face when it was in silence. But here are the data from eight-month-old babies. And you now see that there's no longer a difference. Something strange is happening. That ability goes away. Well, next we asked whether young babies might respond differently to audiovisual speech than older babies might do. And to ask this question, what we did is we presented the BAVA distinction to babies. And the reason we did this is because we know that we English speakers can discriminate between those sounds, but that Spanish speakers cannot discriminate between those sounds. So we set up the following experiment. Ba. Babies just listen to this while they watch that. Ba. Okay. Ba. And after they hear the ba, they watch these two faces, and of course, on the left, she says ba, on the right, she says va, and of course, they should look at the ba. And indeed, what we found was that English learning babies, if you look at that graph again, at those orange bars, they're looking longer at the face that matches what they just heard before, than they look at that same, same face before they heard the vocalization. So they're matching. Now, here are data from babies tested in Spain, where you can see that at six months of age, they are matching, they're looking longer, but by 11 months of age, it's gone. They're no longer making the match, okay? So, here's a fascinating paradox, right? Despite their immaturity and inexperience, babies 
who are young seem to be smarter than older babies. What is going on? Well, what is going on is that young babies come into this world with a certain kind of primitive knowledge, which is based on the detection of very simple low-level perceptual features, like the synchrony between voices and faces, but they don't really detect their identity. But by one year of age, babies become experts. They begin to develop an expertise, and that is based on the fact that they can now detect identity information. They can tell that faces are human. They can tell that this is my own language, and so forth. And what happens in development is that that primitive knowledge that babies possess begins to decline during development, and so that their knowledge of non-native categories declines, and we call that process perceptual narrowing, but that at the same time, their expertise for native categories of information increases, and we call that perceptual broadening. So let me show you an example of how we studied this in our laboratory, those two processes together, and how they actually contribute to the development of, of expertise and knowledge. Good morning. Get up. Come on now. If you get up right away, we'll have an hour to potter around. So while babies were watching these videos, we have an eye tracker device that is below that video. And that eye tracker device allows us to determine precisely where babies are looking on that face. And in this photograph, you can actually see those black little dots. Each of those represents a single visual fixation. What we do is we add them all up together and we put them in a graph like this. Now here, anything above that zero line means that babies are looking longer at the eyes and anything below means that they're looking longer at the mouth. So I want you to notice that first of all, at four months of age, babies are looking primarily at the eyes. But something remarkable happens between eight and 10 months of age. They shift their looking to the mouth. In other words, they begin to lip read right there. And the reason they're lip reading, it turns out, is because this is when babies begin to babble. This is when they're beginning to learn the sounds of their own native language. So what better way to do it than to look at someone's face and try to replicate that or imitate. Now notice another interesting thing that's happening at 12 months of age. It appears as if now they're beginning to shift their eye, their eye gaze back towards the eyes. And we know this because if we compare those data to the adult data, it suggests that they're shifting to the eyes because we as adults do that. And why do they do this? Well, it turns out that this is when they begin to develop their expertise for their native language. So by now, they recognize what they are seeing and hearing. It's their own native language. I've got it. I don't need to lip read anymore because it's familiar to me. Now, just to make sure that this was really related to language acquisition, we did this. Buenos dias. Despiértate ya. Vamos. Si te levantas ahora, tendremos una hora para jugar en la casa. Now, importantly, these are all English learning monolingual babies. So now they're being exposed to a language that will ultimately become foreign to them. So look at what they do. At four months of age, you look at those um, orange bars, they're doing the same thing as they do in response to English. At eight to 10 months of age, they're lip reading like they should be, but something interesting happens here at 12 months of age. At 12 months, it appears that they continue to lip read. And why do they do this? Because now Spanish has become foreign to them. All of a sudden, remember, these are English learning babies who are being raised in an English environment, English speaking environment. They're trying to disambiguate something that has now become unfamiliar to them. Now, finally, my colleagues in Spain recently have conducted a study of babies who are bilingual. That is to say, they are learning Catalan and Spanish at the same time. And we've done exactly those same studies with them. And what you see here is that big bar there, which is marked bilinguals, that's how much lip reading bilinguals do at 12 months of age. So 12 months of age, bilingual babies who are struggling to keep apart two languages sep as separate systems are now doing a great deal of, re of lip reading. So the journey from dilettante to expert then consists of leaving behind you a relatively primitive world that consists of um, a poorly specified world to a world that is now familiar to you, that is well specified. And evolution therefore prepared us for a, this journey with a developmental openness to experience. It didn't code anything. 
Knowledge, therefore, emerges from developmental experience. And what's so interesting about this is that sometimes this developmental process can lead to truly remarkable results.